right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be uh, to be able to welcome Cyril Courtlevin, who is in Antwerp in Belgium. How are you doing, Cyril? Hello. Hi, John. Good to be here. Yeah, and uh, and Cyril is a global speaker and more, more than 20 years has been inspiring organizations like IKEA, NASA and Unilever to approach change with courage, confidence and enthusiasm. His pragmatic advice has earned him the nickname The Simplifier. And what we're going to talk about today is how you can change your mindset to make coping with change that bit more, e that little bit more easy, because let's face it, I mean, change is inevitable. We all know that change is a constant. There seems to be a lot of like a lot of change out there right now and some of it all coming at once. So this is a, a great topic. All right. So let's get straight into it, um, Cyril. First of all, just the uh, your nickname, The Simplifier. Just explain that. I'm often referred to as The Simple One, but that's totally different. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's also possible. No, where, where does The Simplifier come from? I have a feeling that sometimes in life, we human beings, we have a tendency to make things quite complex. And certainly in the business world, you know, if something goes wrong, Instead of just having a chat, what do we do? We go to HR, we come up with, with a procedure, make sure that it never happens. Then an exception happens and we come up with another rule and another rule. And after a while, we don't even know why those rules and regulations are even there. And I really believe that if some simple solutions, they won't solve everything, but I think you can already solve 75, 80% but a very simple solution. But sometimes we forget those simple solutions. So for that reason, what I've tried to do is in my story, also bring a very simple story. So people have uh, probably already heard it. But what I hear from my audiences is that they're also quite happy because you also have the trend watchers and the people mm -hmm. who really have a big vision. And that's absolutely brilliant. But sometimes they overwhelm you with all the new trends and what's happening. And people have sometimes say, OK, and now what can I do tomorrow? So for that reason, I try to make things very easy and simple. Uh, also a serious topic or a big topic like like change or change mindset yeah no that, that, that makes sense i mean because i i agree with you totally it's kind of a human it's a strange human trait but if you sit people down and you say okay here's a, here's a, a process we need to put in place for whatever people will start building it to exceptions as opposed to building it to the rule yes. and, then, and then dealing with exceptions later having that flexibility to deal with the exceptions yeah. Because the, the world will change anyway. You will always have people who, who go in a different way and you can't put it all in a system. So that's also the reason why I think a lot of the big corporates, and it's logical if you compare them with, with the startups, a startup can go a lot faster. But in a big corporate, yeah, you need, you need seven signatures before you can do something. Yeah, you're already two months later, you know, you're already... Uh, and, I think it, it, it has some reasons. You are a big company, so you have to watch out a little bit more. But sometimes we freak a little bit too much to try and control everything. Yes. The world is dynamic. Uh, uh. So so tell us a little bit how you arrived at your, your whole focus on, on making things simple and also in helping people through change. Yeah, what I've done, I studied, uh, I studied economics. And at that moment, uh, to, to be really true, I, I, I did it because my dad studied economics. I could go in several directions. But at one moment, we, we got a training in uh, creativity, creative thinking. And that really opened up my mind. So before, as an economist, I was thinking one plus one is two. And that's the only answer. Yeah, what you learn with creativity is that one plus one could be a lot of different things depending on the context uh, you're working from. So I really got interested in that topic, gave a lot of training, did a lot of brainstorming sessions. And the last five, six years, yeah, I'm, I'm doing more and more speaking. Also went a bit more uh, international. Already spoke in 33 countries and yeah, I love the traveling. And the nice thing about the topic of, of the change mindset, because for me, it also starts from, from your mind, your attitude, if you want 
to change something, your employees or, or the people need to be open for it. It's a very broad topic. You know, it, it's in every industry, like you already announced, certainly in these times, whew, a lot of changes are happening. And I think if we can help people a little bit with being a bit more flexible in their mindsets that they don't immediately go to, yes, but we can't do it. And they go into resistance. If we can help them to open up a little bit, have an, have an open, a bit more agile mind, yeah, a lot of change will be a lot easier. So instead of only putting effort and time and money in the change itself, sometimes it could be very good to, to help people with, with their mindset to open up yeah. a little bit. No, I, I agree. I agree totally. And uh, and you're, you're correct. Sometimes we just paralyze ourselves because, as you said, it's, we turn it into something big immediately or we, as you said, our, our natural instinct is to go, well, wait a second. But what happens? So how do you how do you get over that kind of uh, negative mindset, which is which just seems to be part of human nature? It seems to be something that we have to address because we negative self talk all the time. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And and one of the, the mantras that I sometimes use, you know, this is, by the way, also the way how I present, you know, in the last two years, most people use, they, they go and share their slides. I thought, okay, I'm going to do something different. So I printed my slides and this is the way I would give a presentation and most people really like it. But this is one of my mantras, you know, don't mind to change change your mind instead of focusing all the time energy on the change itself what are different things that we can do and i've written a book on this topic by the way yeah i don't call it a book i call it a bookazine i'm not sure if that's really a word but it's a book with uh, the layout of a magazine yeah. because i think a lot of books are a little bit boring but yeah. you don't have to read it you know because i'm a simplifier i love simple things and i can share i feel like i can share uh, the summary of it and the summary are three words. And for me, it's yes and act. And Good. the yes for me stands for, can, can we suspend our judgment? You know, because as, as human beings, if we want to cope with change a little bit easier, a lot of times we immediately go into the resistance. Or if somebody pops up with, with an idea, you know, what we try to do is, oh no, maybe that's extra work or we have to do different things. And I hope that people don't use the physical tools, but I think they, they will have all kinds of verbal expressions like, yes, but we've already tried it. Yeah, but the boss won't like it. So what I've done, you know, in Belgium, we, we love our beers. So I created a beer coaster. Oh, you can see <laughs> a red side and a green side. And on the red side, you see all kinds of expressions that people, you know, just like you said, we... we have a negative bias so if something new come up we immediately yeah but oh wait we don't have time instead of and that's what i want to do with the yes suspend your judgment i'm not saying no judgment you know a lot of judgment is very good but sometimes it comes a little bit too fast and i invite people to go from a yes to can we go to a yes and you know there's also an exercise from uh, improvisation what would happen if you say yes and and I, I also try to, to make it very pragmatic. So I call it, um, sometimes do an exercise just to let people feel the different energy. It's, it's totally different. If you are in a room and you go for the yes, but the first minute, phew, energy will go down. Uh, after a while, every, everybody is bored. If you go in the yes and suddenly <laughs> volume goes up. It's, it's a very simple exercise, yeah. but you can... Also use it, you know, really in, in a meeting, what I sometimes say, you have a meeting, 10 agenda points. I would say nine of them, logical thinking. Do what you normally do. You know, I'm not the yes and guy. Then you have to, to watch that movie. Uh, I'm more the, the common sense guy. You know, if something is working, brilliant. But if it's not working, then sometimes it's also stupid to, to try it again and again and again. No, at those moments, we need to change mindset, uh, what I call. And I call it the three-minute rule. Then I ask people, okay, explain the exercise for three minutes, no, yes, but. And how it works is as follows. So, for example, we do a brainstorm, yep. and you, John, you say, yes, but we already talked about it in the <laughs> podcast. Then you can grab the card and red card, like in soccer, European yeah. soccer, you get a red card. 
you killed one idea. The punishment <laughs> is you have to come up with two new ones. Uh, very simple, very fast. What happens, you create an atmosphere where uh, things are possible. You do it for three minutes, then you look at the elements that, that you could do. You don't have to do all of them, but maybe you pick some small mm -hmm. pieces from, from several ideas. And yeah, I'm so amazed. I'm already doing this exercise quite long. And most people have heard this exercise, sure. but it's amazing if people really apply it, you know, if they really. I, I, think, I think part of it, um, Cyril, is that people don't understand the power of the words that come out of their mouths, right? And they don't understand where they come from. It's like, for instance, what you were just saying there, when somebody comes up with an idea and you immediately go, ah, yeah, but, you know, uh, that may have absolutely nothing to do with the idea and it may have everything to do with the state of mind you're in or yes. something else that's coming from the outside and you're just yes. you're channeling. Absolutely. And I'm also not saying that something is wrong with yes, but, but if we can create a context, if we want to look at some new ideas, you can imagine a lot of sales and marketing people, you know, when the whole pandemic started, the logical way wasn't working anymore. You couldn't go on a visit to a client. So you could say, yeah, but I don't like Zoom. I don't like other tools. Yeah, okay. But you have to look, you have to look for alternatives. So for me, th this is a first step. And then a second step is maybe that we as human beings sometimes have a tendency to look in one direction. No, I'm the sales manager and you approach everything from that point of view, which is logical. You know, it's the reason why you are hired. But sometimes if the logical way is not working, can we look from a different angle? Hey, how would somebody from a different department solve that problem? And that's, yeah, maybe, maybe my biggest lesson that I've learned in, yeah, I'm now busy with creativity, innovation the last 20 years. I would say this is my biggest insight. The insight that there is not only one path to success. You could also take a parachute. You, you, you can shoot yourself with a cannon. And one thing that I've learned is that you, you can almost, in every case, you can find an alternative. It will cost money. It will cost time. You have to do a lot of effort and it won't be ready tomorrow. But don't say that things are not possible. You know, the, the impossible is maybe closer sometimes uh, than we think yeah. and, and the other and the other part that, that you were just saying there about uh, you know looking being blinkered and looking at things through one lens only i think that's an incredibly important uh, point because i do think with the nature of work and everything changing and roles becoming a little bit more fluid and people yes. you know, even in sales you got to do a little bit of marketing now you got to do a little bit of research yep. you're no longer uh, so that is that's incredibly important that you're able to sort of look at things from different dimensions and that takes some good empathy yeah absolutely and and i really believe that it is a skill that you can that you can practice it that you can can learned from different angles now maybe this this might be a nice thing to show I, I created this 3d artwork you know and if you look from this angle to it you can see the word no a problem difficulty but what would happen if you approach this from a different angle you know and then the no would become a yes it's this is just a 3d thing that that the artwork changed no the artwork didn't change how you look at it change. And I think you, John, you probably also have seen a lot of examples in your industry from when the whole pandemic started, everybody, oh, problem, difficult. But some organizations, some people have said, hey, wait a minute. Maybe, you know, already for years, we were trying to work more in a digital way to help our clients in, in, in a virtual world. And, you know, they they approach the same thing from, from the yes. And, I'm not saying that the no or the yes is better. What I want to learn people is, hey, there are more possibilities. And it doesn't mean that you have to, have to believe all of them or, or, or go to the different, listen to a different perspective, but at least listen to it or at least know that it exists because then you have more choices. And then you can say, hey, wait a minute, what would work best in which situation so i think it is a skill like you're saying jobs are changing 
project. It's, it's what I'm seeing is more and more project work. So you work on a project and you have a yeah. specific role and the next uh, project you do something different or you approach it from a different angle. And I, and I think this is where what you're talking about becomes even more critical, because if you think about it, uh, as you said, I, I agree, I think a lot of work is now project based and you you bring in the skill sets for the project. And so you may be doing one thing here, another thing. So your ability to be able to look at things from different angles and from different perspectives is even more critical because otherwise, every time you put a project team together, it's going to it's going to get stuck at the beginning because you're going to have everybody's going to be saying yes, but or yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. And then my last step, and, and this is also quite a logical one. Uh, yes suspend judgment and look from a different angle you have to get into action you have to you have to do something you know we can talk a lot about ideas but if you don't don't act on it or, or do some experiments uh, it's a nice thinking exercise but nothing nothing will will really change and i'm going to show you already this part um you know of a slide i think we human beings were very good in creating a plan and it's 27 steps and then we freed your goal you know, but then reality kicks in and reality always looks different than, than the real thing. I had, I had a conversation with, uh, it was a, a financial uh, organization here in Belgium. And uh, they said, Cyril, when, you, when we saw that cartoon, I have, to, I have to share something. And he was telling that he was working in the sales team, eight people, and um, their fiscal year started in January. He said already in August, September, we start working on our sales plan of the next year with a team of eight people for four months. Not They were not working on it the whole time. Yeah, yeah. But then he said, Cyril, it was a perfect plan. At the end of January, we had to throw it away because the world has already changed quite, quite big time because there was a new law. There was a competitor that came up with a solution. Then suddenly we had a whole pandemic. And all the time they had to change their plans. So I'm not saying that we don't need plans anymore, but maybe we need a little bit some some milestones yeah. because the world is so volatile that that at least if you have the skills to change, probably that's more important instead of having the perfect plan because you know one thing for sure if you have a perfect plan that it will change. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, can I, we I take? Think yeah, I think you're right. Is that a roadmap? Uh, you know, you make a roadmap and sort of map out how you how you think you're going to get to wherever, and then you sort of go, okay, and we'll adjust as we go, and we'll and we'll flex as we go. Because you're right. I mean, you can. I worked in a company once where we used to um, for our parent company, like I had to prepare the sales plan. You know, from about it was literally about the same. It was probably about August, August to the end of September or something, and then presented and all of that. And of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. It spent so much time and yet everything would change. You know, we have financial crisis, we have this, we have that. So, yeah, I, I agree to you have to kind of have a roadmap and a goal, but then you need to say, OK, how we get there may change. Yeah, yeah. And then and, and can we leave also some uh, responsibility to the people who are really busy with it? You know, we can say uh, this is the goal, but don't explain step by step how you have to get there. I, it's totally okay if there's a new person to give that person tools and tips and how you normally do it, but but don't make it again the procedure because it will work work against you. What I then sometimes recommend is what I call, and this comes from the whole world of, of agile uh, agile work and agile thinking, is can you can you take some very small steps and I call it I call it a nano action. So what's nano action? Yeah, here it's still in, in euro, but you can also take uh, dollars. So you have a very small amount of money, limited budget, limited time. You have you have uh, ten dollars. You have one hour of time. Why those two? Because those two are often the biggest idea killers. We don't have time. We don't have money. You know, you can you can shout it anytime because nobody has a lot of time. Nobody has. All the money that he wants but i'm quite sure that everybody can find you know ten dollars okay that that should be possible and one hour you know if you plan it now next week then what could be your nano action to see if something works or not so instead of sitting behind your desk 
and, and trying to figure out in theory, pick up the phone, you know, call a colleague. Uh, maybe you can have a chat with a client and say, hey, this is an idea that we have and, and see what the reaction is. And if you build it up in that way, because a lot of people think that agile is only for IT. No, yeah. I think you can you can do those nano actions on, on anything. You know, you can you can make it very small. And then at least you're you're moving. You know, something is happening and some of those steps will be success, some not. But probably you've learned more than the person behind the desk, you know, who is still yeah. creating the perfect plan. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like um, some years ago um I did lean office training. Uh, <clears throat> And and the whole concept, you know, of lean is the exact same. Is just get rid of, you get rid of all of the things that don't make sense. And it's amazing. And what I learned about it, Cyril, mostly is when you lay out a process as it is it is today, and you put and you put the proper time in it. So I maybe it takes me five minutes to do something. I hand it over to Cyril, but it takes Cyril. It takes Cyril five minutes to do his part, but it takes him two days to get there. So his part is not five minutes. His part is two days and five minutes. And when you start yeah. to look at all of this, you go, oh, my goodness, we have a process that takes two days to that takes two days to execute on paper. But it's actually four weeks. What's going on? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and those processes are quite interesting to look at, you know, because yeah. apparently something is blocking it or there are a lot of idea killers in the way and that keep the project from uh, from running smoothly. Now, yeah. Maybe a last thing, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I want to, um, I can introduce or, or give the listeners and the viewers also a new word because we came up with a, with a new word because it was saying sometimes an, an action is a, a success, but sometimes not. And we call it a lot of times a failure this is already interesting, you know, in the different cultures in, in the US, failure is doesn't have to be a real bad thing. You know, if you failed several times, that means that you probably have learned a lot. In Europe, it's already a little bit in the middle, but I think in Asia, if you already say the word failure, it, it, it's already dangerous. So for that reason, we come up with a new word, and that's the word a nearling. A nearling. And what's a nearling? Nearling is a positive word for something that you did with the right intention, which has not yet led to the right result. Because, you know, failure, it still has a little bit of a negative, you know, commendation. Nobody likes to, to fail, but a nearling, you know, it's a made up word. And you, you could be proud. So for me also, if uh, success would be one, you know, and, and failure would be zero, because we think quite binary, then a nearling would be the 0 0.1, the 0 0.3, the 0 0.9. And instead of yeah, being shamed or not daring to share it, be, be proud of your nearlings, because at least you've tried something, you took initiative, you have to learn something from it. So I think we can also, in, in the business world, learn more from each other if we would share some more nearlings instead of only the successes. Yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic point, Cyril, because I think oftentimes uh, that's what I think why people often get very frustrated and feel inadequate is because they see all these successes out there and they think everybody's successful. What they don't see is the journey there or they don't see the nearlings that you were talking about. You don't yes. see how many of those they had. And, you know, they think people are overnight success. But, yeah, it might have taken them 10 years to be that overnight success. So I, I really I really like it because there are cultural differences. Yeah. And I'll tell you. There's, um, there's somebody I know and a friend of his, he says he has two things up on his office wall. One is his Harvard MBA and the other is his first Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And he <laughs> always says to say, which of those experiences do you think I learned more from? And he'll always say it was the bankruptcy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. And, and we have a tendency, I think, in, in certainly in the business world to, you know, only we show the success and no, also talk about the things that, that didn't go go well, because sometimes we can learn more from those elements than uh, oh, yeah, the only successes. Are our greatest teachers, uh, our, our nearlings, as I'm going to adopt that word now, our nearlings are, are, can be our, our best teachers. Yeah, um, I can imagine it. Yeah. Well, listen, Cyril, this has been fantastic. All of Cyril's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. 
Yeah, I think uh, indeed, if you want to know more, go to my website the, that you can find. So I'm mainly working as, as a speaker. What I really hope is that we can travel international and intercontinental again. So uh, we've already been a few times to, to the US. I think just before the pandemic, we had a chance to do something at uh, NASA in, in Houston. So that was, that was really nice to, to see how they are doing their creativity and innovation uh, processes. So, uh, and people who are interested in the topic of change mindset, how we can cope with it, feel free to, uh, to reach out. Yeah, absolutely. I would really encourage you to be because as we've as we said, you know, change is a constant. And I, I was measured like I'm originally from Ireland, but I came here to the US during the dot com era. And so since I've been in the US, <clears throat> been through the dot com explosion and then implosion, 9-11, the financial crisis, now obviously the pandemic. So every, so there are constant changes, small ones, big, but every so often there are big like upheavals. So the more you can the more you can be able to handle change, the better it's going to be for you. So I would encourage you to check out Cyril's work. Perfect. Thanks a lot, John. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Cyril. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon.